So thanks everyone for coming. Great crowd. I'm real excited here to be here today to talk to you about um, about making casual 3D games, really. But the, the technology we're going to talk about is a technology called SceneKit. I'm going to focus on showing it in iOS. Just know that it's completely available on Mac. It's actually been available in the Mac for the last two years, and it's just come to iOS 8 now. It's uh, it's pretty great. So let's let's get started. So. 3D graphics, you know, and I've done 3D graphics in, in various forms for, for quite some time, are hard. It's a hard thing to learn, and even when you learn it, it's, it's it, the, the APIs that you use, typically, especially OpenGL, it's very laborious. Um, to draw simple things and, and, and do work and keep it high performance is quite a bit of work, and it takes years of, to really become expert at it, it takes years, and even then, it's, it's quite difficult. And even for the folks that do it from the Windows side with DirectX, um, they have, they have you know, they, they have a similar learning curve to in, in, in amount of work to deal with. So 3D is hard. So in, in an effort to make 3D graphics, casual 3D graphics, where you're not trying to make the AAA game, or you're just trying to get some 3D visualizations or make a casual game, things like that, but still have them be excellent and look nice and have high performance, to, to do it and bring it in more to the, to the masses, so we're, we're any good programmer but that doesn't have this expertise in 3D, which really is an expertise, um, the concept of a scene graph was developed, and scene graphs have been around for years. The idea of a scene graph is that instead of having to deal with all the, the minutia of the rendering in the lower level OpenGL, so speaking specifically within OpenGL yourself, you deal at a higher level. And you do things declaratively, where you just say, hey, I'm going to set up a scene. I'm going to declare what's in the scene, and the rendering ha is taken care of for you. So it, it commoditizes, it makes it very much easier to do 3D graphics and 3D development in both, in both games and in applications, right? And this, this concept of a scene graph is nothing new. It's been around for years. What's new here is, and I'm presenting today, is, is, a, is an implementation of a scene graph API called SceneKit. And what SceneKit is, is SceneKit is an API from Apple that allows you to, to do a scene graph on Apple's platforms, iOS and the Mac. Been previously the last two years, and as I mentioned, on iOS 8 now, it's been very excited to have it there. And what it does is, it does the classic things you'd expect in a scene graph, where it handles the rendering for you. You declare what's going to be in your scene, and then it takes care of rendering everything for you, just as if by magic, very declarative. What's really interesting, though, you say, okay, that's great, but if scene graphs have, graphs have been around for years, great, it's on Apple's platform, what's special? The fact that it is on Apple's platform and Apple's developed it, they can do in some cases, the only ones that can do certain things because they have access to, to APIs and, and, and can do things that aren't exposed in APIs to third-party developers. And you know, they're, they're really targeting, you know, they have developers that are expert in iOS and obviously on the Mac. So you what you have here is you have a scene graph API that's developed for Apple's platforms and then subsequently integrates nicely with existing Apple frameworks. And we'll see some of that as we go through the talk and what that means. And how you, some, if you've, anyone that's done iOS development in the audience, some of your existing skills are going to come forward into working with SceneKit. And the scene graph part of it is very straightforward, even if you don't have a 3D graphics background. So someone without a 3D graph, graphics background, but that has a, a little bit of iOS understanding, could work with this and achieve some pretty nice things. So that's the bigger idea here, right? So what would you do with something like SceneKit? You think 3D graphics, you, you start thinking of you know, c complex games. Um, you can make games, and that's how, how it's been positioned, really, in, in this recent uh, release that's come to iOS 8. As a, the term Apple is actually used, I'm taking their term there, a ca casual 3D games, you know, simpler ones, um, not ones that would be, you wouldn't be developing a Halo and something like this. It's, it's really not the appropriate tool, but something that is 3D, you know, like this example we have here, and I'm going to show you a bit um, of a little toy car demo. You could do something like that. But if you're not a game developer and you just come into this and, well, let's see what it's all about. Because it's integrated so nicely with the application frameworks, your UI kit, your core animation, things that you're using independent of any games, you could, de you could develop 3D within applications that are just apps, that aren't games, for doing things like visualizations, right? Data visualizations and get real creative with it. You know, charts, imagine, you know, envision a, a, a bar chart that's floating or, or infographics, things like that. So you can do some cool visualization type applications. And additionally, um, I've got some examples to, sh um, to point you to that you could actually make a whole presentation application. You can make a really cool kind of PowerPoint that does 3D things in it. So the, the kind of things you'd, you'd see in there. So these are the kind of applications you, you would build, right? And certainly, it's really been designed now 
Um, not just having the 3D and the scene graph part of it, but for 3D games, there's other things that you would expect to have, and you, they've added that with this release that's come to iOS 8, where they really can say it's not that it's just a scene graph, but it has some of the things you would need to really properly develop a 3D game, a simpler one, casual, if you will. So with that, I want to talk about some of the basics of the, the API. Now, what, what you're doing is, in any, any scene graph, you're basically building up, you know, it's, it's a graph, it's a tree of nodes. <clears throat> So what you have with scene kit at the top of the at the top of the top of the world is is the scene right that you're putting and that's everything that's going to you're going to display on the screen or, or subsequently not display on the screen but has things in 3D space and then you build up these, this hierarchy of nodes what a node is a node doesn't put anything onto the screen it represents a position in 3D space and the way you have things appear in 3D in this in, in 3D space within the scene is by putting things onto these nodes attaching things to the nodes such as geometry your 3D geometry, such as materials to make the nose and the, gra the graphics that are attached to the nose appear a certain way. You add lighting in a scene to illuminate it, and there's different kinds of lighting. And a camera to, 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 to represent the point of view that you would have, so how, you, how you're actually looking at the scene. You can, you can change the point of view and the field of view that you would see as well. And you do, when you do all this and you build up this scene graph, again, big point, and they, they've done it very well in this case, you don't ever get into like, you know, making a GLBind call, if any folks are familiar with that. You're not rendering anything directly. Scene graphs doing it for you. That said, as a, as a, as a brief aside, you can dip down into OpenGL and, and extend it and do some more advanced things. You can bring shaders in and do things. It's not what we're going to go into today, but if you already have OpenGL background, as a slight aside, in a more advanced talk I might do um, at some point, you can take that skill forward into this, and it'll make the things you already know just, you'll appreciate even more how much easier it makes some things, right? So that's like, kind of, that, that's how you set, that's how you work with the thing, right? And then the things you would attach are like materials, lights, geometry, and um, like I mentioned with the camera. So what's the geometry all about? <clears throat> um, excuse me. So the geometry represents, you know, what, you, what you'd expect. It's like some three, 3D geometric, geometric model. Now, there's a couple ways to bring in geometry, and I'm going to show you um, one way that you can bring it in. You can bring it in from, from 3D art tools. And out of the box, Apple gives you a bunch of primitives. You can see here we have a sphere, and we have a box, because you have a cube, basically. There's a plane. There's a pyramid. You can have a cone. You get this um, nice tube here. You get the, the capsule that you can create. There's a cylinder, and there's a torus, right? So that's, that's quite a bit. If you're, if you're going to make, if you're going to take an approach that I'm going to create some kind of a visualization application, these primitives will be your friends because now I can start animating the jump, changing it, and, and doing some cool things. And for a casual game, you can envision like putting some kind of material to make that look like an inner tube or boxes that can look like blocks, things like that. So you can do, you can achieve quite a bit actually with with all these primitives, um, and that's pretty great, right? There's another th way though the, to, to take it to another level where you actually can bring in models, and I'm going to show you what that's in a little bit later in the talk too. All right, so now, once you have your, your geometry is in the scene, how do you make it show up? Like, how, how do I have this color on the screen? Well, scene kit has lighting built in. And again, it's, everything's very declarative, right? You're just adding lights into the scene, and that illuminates the scene. There's different kinds of lighting. There's ambient lighting, which is just the, the, the lighting that goes in all direction within the scene. So that's like in here, I would have said ambient lighting to be red, and that's how I can illuminate everything red. I can have directional lighting, which is lighting in, in a constant direction, linearly. So it's like, like shining a constant uh, cylinder on one spot, right, in one area. You have omni-lighting, which is a, um, a point light, like a light, light bulb kind of thing, so it's a point light to have, and a spotlight. So that's a it goes out in a conic, right, conical light, like, like spotlight that's coming down on you if you're on a stage, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, here's an example of like, you know, I can illuminate the thing with, with a, some directional lighting. You can see I get some shadowing in the back because I still have the, um, the ambient lighting and the scene is red, but it illuminates as the light's coming down in front, right? Again, ver very declarative. So now, great. That's how I can attach lighting in the scene, but how, what if I want to now change how the, the, the geometry looks within some light, light lit up environment? Well, that's what materials do. And the, 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 big, the big thing about what materials is doing is it's affecting how the light, you know, how things reflect light and how things absorb light. You know, it's modeling that. And what you can do with it is you can change the appearance of the surface of the geometry. So in this case, you know, I can set the materials, in, there's actually a, a diffuse property on the material, and you attach the material to the geometry. Right? So I have some geometry, I attach the material, and then I set some property on the material to give it something that it's going to look like, such as a color, red. But I can do more than that. I can make it have an image. And without writing it, it just a, a, really a single line of code, I can get an image mapped onto the thing. And then you can go further. You can do normal maps and texture maps. You can then subsequently cause it to apply surfaces and do some neat things like that. 
but there's more than that. So that's, that's kind of what you'd expect. Nothing, that sort of concept's been around for a while that we can just easily map um, with any scene graph where you could even easily map an image onto the geometry through something that, that would typically be called a material, right? What's neat here is it's a UI image, so again, you're working within the framework, um, so it's gonna be very comfortable to an iOS developer. But there's more. I can attach a CA layer. So core animation, right, a CA layer. So here I'm playing a video from my buddy James Montemagno and, and Aaron Bachover, so you can create your Aaron and James cube. Right? It's hard to put those guys in a cube. But, um, there, there they are, playing a video on a cube mapped on the surface and, and animating and rotating. We'll see that, too. So I can apply a CA layer to a, the material. I can even apply, as you, saw, as you might, have, might, have, might have saw in the description here, a uh, SK node from the 2D game framework that Apple's created that they opened last year in iOS 7 and now enhanced a little bit in iOS 8 called Sprite Kit. It's a 2D, similar, conic, really just targeted at games, 2D games. Um, and represent um, things in SpriteKit via an SK node. So I could have achieved the same exact thing through a, a SpriteKit node, but I could take a whole SpriteKit game and map it right onto a 3D surface. But then I can also do cool effects with SpriteKit. I could play videos that way. It's a little easier to do than dropping down into a CA layer to do it. But either way, so you can create some pretty neat effects by doing that and real f a lot of flexibility in the materials, right? Now, what else can you control? I mentioned that, like, well, how are we controlling what we're looking at? So here I have a model of a Stanley Cup. I just brought in a model here. So I get this 3D model, not a primitive. We'll, mention, we'll get to that in a second. And how do I um, change the camera? So this is going to look like I'm rotating it around, but what I'm, I'm not actually, the, the model's actually not moving. I'm just moving the camera around. Of course, we can rotate the model, and there's you know, a lot of capability for animation and transforming things is a variety of ways. But in this case, I'm just moving the camera around in different positions. Right? You can even add multiple cameras right, and do some, do some neat things. And, um, so stuff like that. So there's the camera, and you can change how things look in a scene. Um, create interesting displays. You can think in a game how I can then, at runtime, you know, program the camera to then move, and so I can change the point of view that I'm looking at the thing with. So I'm I'm either looking at it from a top down, or I'm in the you know the the, the first person, third person to a first person type of experience. Very very easy to do with this, right? But now you saw with that example though, for the first time I've brought in now showing you a model. So of course I said there's all these primitives, and you can do a lot with primitives. Okay, but if you really want to do, now maybe not so much in visualization applications, you may be able to achieve almost everything you need with primitives, right? And just working directly with like the geometry classes. If I'm gonna make a game, a casual game, in almost all cases, unless you can come up with some kind of a creative idea to do things with spheres, which you very well may be, you're gonna typically be seeing an art, an, a 3D artist you're gonna be working with or getting a 3D the work from a 3D artist that put it on some site, like this one here I just I downloaded from the, the SketchUp site online that, that Google used to have. And you, you want to bring these 3D models in, these 3D assets. So artists, tools like Maya, Blender, you know, 3D Studio Max, these things, these kind of 3D design tools all export, uh, they export a lot of different file formats, but one common one in, in the industry is called a Collada file. I don't even call it open standard, but it's, it's something of a standard. It's been around for some time. It's a very well-known format that, that, that represents a, a 3D model, but not just the model. You can, in, in a tool like a Maya, you can put animations of the model, things like that. So within a Collada file, you know, and the DAE stands for a digital asset exchange. So it's just this common format for moving, that, that's pretty well-known for moving models around between different systems. And 3D CAD systems work with them as well. SceneKit can, in one line of code, bring in a, a Collada file with all the animations that, that can be described in a cloud, a file, there are none in the one I showed you, and then and put it right into the scene, and the entire scene graph gets built up from the cloud file, including the animations. So remember that, I just mentioned animations now, remember that point, it's like, what does that mean, bringing in the animations? I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. So, and you can manipulate these things from code is what's really key. So you bring it in from a design tool, and now I can program against all the little things that were designed by my designer, are first class programmable, as if they were created by somebody creating the geometry for all this in code. It's really easy, uh, it's pretty great. So in Xcode now, there's a tool to view Collada files, and you could actually make small tweaks to it. This isn't a modeling tool, right? You don't have to use Xcode for development, anything like that with Xamarin, so you work with it all in Xamarin Studio, but just to, to view and maybe make small tweaks to the Collada file, this tool is available. And then you simply bring in, you know, you bring in the asset into um, Xamarin Studio or Visual Studio. Likewise, the preview in, in, in Finder 
on OS X, you can just you'll go into you can go into quick look like that basically, and you can see the model and rotate it around. So there's good support for viewing and making tiny tweaks to Collada files um, on the Mac. All right, but you you, you wouldn't, it's not a full blown modeling tool in any way, right? So if you're going to be bringing in models, you would either be going to a site like I did there and get the asset down as long as it has a proper license or you've purchased it at all, or work with a work with a 3D artist. Right? And if uh, Blender, if, if, if people are interested in three, just, just as quick aside, if people are interested in, there's a tool called Blender that's open source, it's free, it's pretty great. Not easy to learn though, it's like the whole skill of its own. So now that I did mention though here, what I brought in this um, 3D model and, and I mentioned that you can have animations put in by your artist, so the artist can animate things in it and I, I can program against it that. And what does that mean? So this is another th thing that they built right into to Scenekin and they did it really well. When I have those animations, or if I have primitives, of course, right? Like, like the primitives I have, the, the box, the sphere, and so on, I can animate them. And the way they did animation in SceneKit is exactly what you already know if you're doing iOS. Well, for the most part, you probably know. If, if not, it's, it's, it's well known to many iOS developers. It's called core animation. Underneath iOS is core animation. And everything you see in iOS, every view, is backed by a thing called a, a core animation layer. The neat thing about core animation, it's basically a bitmap compositing engine, and so that's how you can get, that's how you can get very fluid experiences in the user interface of all the higher level controls in UIKit. The programming model that you animate with, you can either do it at the higher level within UIKit and underneath it abstracts core animation, or you can go directly to core animation. That's, what, that's business we've already had now for, for, since the first day of iOS, right? We have a lot of great resources about core animation on our doc site if you want to check out. We have some, some great webinars and some videos we did as well if you need to learn about it that. It's, really, it's very straightforward and it's very powerful. And if you're an iOS developer already, you pretty much already know this, I bet, most likely. So, you come to scene kit, hey, I know how to animate already. I know how to animate because I already know core, anima core animation. Ex implicit animations, explicit animations. Someone that knows core animation before ne having never even looked at 3D would already know what that means. But I'll show you what it means though, for just to get everyone on the same page. An implicit animation, when I do that, I create a transaction and I, what I do is inside of the transaction, I, I specify all the things I want to animate, the values, it's called the model property, the thing you're going to change to. Right? There's actually another value called a presentation value. That's the in-flight value. But what you're setting is the model value. So in this case, the one thing that's a little different is the programming model is the same with implicit animations as core animation. But you do have to use, when working with SceneKit, the, the SCN transaction class instead of CA transaction. But that's it. It works exactly the same way. You call SCN transaction begin instead of normally if you're doing it in, a, in, in an app with, 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 um, CA, you know, with core animation and layers you would use CA transaction. But you just call begin, and then you just, you, you can set a variety of properties that will control the animation that's gonna cr be created for you implicitly, right? And then, for example, in this case, I'm creating a rotation to rotate the thing by four pi, and I apply it to the node. So I have a box node, an SCN box node is the instance of the primitive I've used there. And then I commit the animation. So it, the, the one thing that would be a different if you were doing this in just CA, you know, in, in regular, uh, a regular app, you, in, with core animation, you would have changed the CA layer. Okay. Same exact programming model when working with, with animations though, um, when doing implicit animations, just do this different class. And you see I do that and I can get, I'll get the node rotation here in a second. So I rotated it about, uh, about the Y axis in that case, right? So what else can I do? Core animation also has explicit animations. So explicit animations are when the, the implicit animation is, is implicit. It doesn't let me control the animation the way I want. For example, I'm not sure, I'm just for simplicity of showing, I made a simple example that's similar to the one before. But the way I would, when I would go to a, an explicit animation is when I want to control the animation, meaning I want to change the timing function, for example, to change how it eases, things like that, okay? And there's a variety of other things beyond that. So when you're doing an explicit animation, you're actually creating an animation class, such as the CA basic animation here, right? So I'm an instance of an animation class. That's what gets created via the implicit one under the covers for you. But here I'm going to explicitly create a CA animation class, a CA basic animation, there's a keyframe one, and so on. And I'm going to use key value programming to say what I'm going to animate, rotation. Once I have this animation, I set the values I'm going to go to, right? Again, the duration, what I'm going to rotate to in this case. I just got this, this little vector class here that I can use to specify four things. There's another one that can specify three things, pretty straightforward. And then I add the animation 
and, and here I'm working with explicit animations. In this case, there is no SCN basic animation. You are working with the core animation class, CA basic animation. At the end of the day, I come down and I, apply, I add the animation to the node in the scene graph, much like you would add it to the layer. Okay, so that's all I'm doing. I create the animation, just like I've always done in, in, with core animation. I add, it, I add the anima animation to the node, and I can do you know, complex animations, but even you know, this simple one, I just rotated it around a different axis to show it's different. So that's an explicit animation. So great, that's great. I already know, if I already know animation, I know how, with core animation, I've already been an iOS developer, I can work with animation in this, this 3D graphics API without really having done any real 3D graphics work in code. So this is pretty, pretty sweet. Now, what if you're making a game, and, and core animation was, is, is, is wonderful. It's really designed, though, as a programming model to work with from apps, really. I'm distinguishing apps from games. Of course, they're apps, too. But what if I'm going to do a game, though? What do you think about an app? If I'm, I have an app, I might have something slides in. I might have some subtle in it, little animations here and there to give it a little polish, this nice fluid feel that people like, and that's why they come back and use your applications. Great. But you do too much animation in an application, just like logically. Users are going to say, things going all over the place. It becomes unusable. Unlike a game where you're animating all the time. So you, you're doing a lot of this kind of work. It would be a little bit laborious to work with in core animation. If I was going to do a visualization type app, I, I'd probably be all right with this. So what Apple did, and this is the, one of the steps that they took now to make this um, where they can term, use the term, it's, it's okay for a casual 3D game. You could have done it without this, but this is the kind of thing you'd expect in a, some, a simpler game engine, be it 2D or 3D. So in SpriteKit, there was a, there's this concept of actions right, that have existed before in other game frameworks as well, of course, right? And it allows you to declare, again, th this kind of higher level declarative idea, do things. So instead of actually creating an animation class implicitly or, or implicitly, I can just say, hey, I want something to happen, such as uh, rotation, right? I hereby declare there shall be rotation. And then the thing, I, I, I just run the action on a node, right? And the animation happens. So that thing you saw before breaks down to this, or falls down to this one line of code, and I can achieve the exact same thing. Pretty nice, now I've got that in one, kind of, one line of code. What can I do though? I, I haven't really written any animation code. I've just written the code that's just, I haven't transformed any matrices, anything like that. I haven't touched a transform. I'm just saying do this thing, like a person, almost like a person would just write it on a piece of paper and tell you what to do. Very declarative, almost like a scripting language within the thing in some ways. That's what these actions do for you. And you could chain a whole bunch of them together, right? So it um, becomes very powerful if you wanted to do lots of little things in, in your game. Um, um, there are some more advanced capabilities where you could actually jump into the render loop and you can control, control movement manually if you need to for <laughs> performance. And you could also do that in, a, in, a, in an override you can do for physics simulations. Physics simulations, so think about that. We'll come back to that. So another thing that they added in SceneKit that, uh, that you really need for games is to be able to do effects. As you're making a game or even a visualization, you want to have cool effects, you want to make things look cool. If I'm doing OpenGL, I can achieve this with, with, with shaders, right? Um, Again, we're trying to not use OpenGL. Certainly, if you already know how to do that, if you understand what I just said, you can, you can use shaders within SceneKit. Right? And I have some examples after if, if, folks are, if folks are interested in that. So you can extend it with OpenGL. That's one of the things you can do. And you can create effect, the, the effects I'm about to show you. They do have, there are limitations where the, your creativity can go beyond the bounds of what it can do. But you can do quite a bit with what I'm about to go into. So one of the kind of effects that, again, very high level thing that you would see in game systems and game, en game engines and platforms are particle systems, be it 2D or 3D. So what they've built here, and again, it's just something you put into a scene graph. They have this class called an SCN particle system, and it's very customized. You know, you, there's all kinds of options to customize emission rates and colors and, 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 and all kinds of things with it. They can be applied to geometry. So what that means is, say I had a sphere or a cube or my Stanley Cup, I can have the particle system layered onto the surface of the geometry, like you could do with a shader if you were doing it with OpenGL. You don't have to get into all that, though. You can very easily do it. So I could have rain falling on the surface of something, or you can create some kind of fire on it and cool effects. They are affected by physics. Again, I'm mentioning physics. And there's an editor built into Xcode. So again, this is an Xcode. You don't have to write any code in Xcode, but they, they, a second tool that they built in, in addition to the Collada viewer, and uh, it's not just a viewer that's tweaking. You can make small tweaks and edit things is this, this particle system editor. It's actually quite nice. It creates a new file called an SCNP file that has the information about 
the uh, particle system, that is the particle system, and it also there's the textures that would subsequently go along with the particle system, any textures that support it. You just use this tool, you just, you can, you write in the visual design tool, you can create your particle system. There's a bunch of ones that come out of the box, fire and, and different things. You can tweak them, you just take the file, drop it right into Xamarin Studio. We have a special FCN asset build action in Xamarin Studio, in Visual Studio too. And it just, it just all works, it all gets built properly. Under the covers, there's a tool called FCN Util that gets run by our tooling that, that, that Apple ships with the whole thing. So we run it underneath and everything gets packaged and built properly and shipped. It gets post, -pro it's, a, it's one thing that runs post-process while it's building. But you don't have to worry about that. You just set the FCN, um, it, it, there's a special scene kit action, build action you set on the thing. So yeah, that's all you have to do. You can bring it right in. You can have, you can have particle systems like the rain that we had just falling there. Okay, and that was falling in 3D. It looked 2D in the, because I'm just showing it, but it, of course, if I kind of rotated things around, you'd see it in 3D. So pretty great. Now we have, you have effects, you, you have actions, you have particle systems. We're seeing the kind of things you'd expect in a, in a, you know, a simpler game engine, along with the, the ability to do 3D things without really having to you know, dip down into the lower levels of, of OpenGL at all, if you don't want to. But wait, there's more, because again, we saw some integration with core animation like we've seen here. I mentioned how it can work with SpriteKit and we're gonna see some things, but this, this continues throughout the whole thing. Say I wanted to use something, these things are all images at the end of the day, the textures, right? Say I wanted to use an imaging library like Core Image, right? A library that you, know, you don't think of really in, in games all that much to apply some kind of a, an imaging effect um, within my game, within my, my, 3D, my 3D application. Not a game here, of course, just a cube with the monkey on it that I've surfaced. Um, I can use core image. I can use core image exactly as, I, as you know it right now, out of the box. Um, all I have to do is I apply the filters to the, to the node, the FCN node. So in this case, I've just got a simple one. I created a, the, the CI pixelate filter. You can do things with, for folks that haven't worked with core image, it's, a, it's an imaging library that allows you to do a variety of imaging effects like you know, a Gaussian blur, pixelating an image, you can do sepia tone, a noir filter, black, make it look black and white. And it's really great in that core image, and now we're independent of scene kit, anything to do with it. You can just use this in regular iOS apps or on the Mac. You can chain a whole bunch of these filters together, create them what is in effectively a recipe, okay? And then apply that all into the GPU in one, it, just, it all gets rendered in one step. So it's very efficient uh, core image. And it, 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 the, the programming model is exactly the same here. It's, it's everything you already know if you've worked with core image. You're just simply applying it to the node, right? And it, and, and it affects the entire hierarchy of that node. So in this case, that couple lines of code, I'll do the same animated monkey, I, the, the box spinning example. See, now it pixelates. Right? And if I had a whole tree, if I had 10 nodes, it would pixelate them all, okay? Of course, at a certain point, you gotta be, you gotta be cognizant of performance if you, you do too many things. I gotta say, okay, there's, there's, they have, they've thought of that. There's things built in for flattening a scene down. You know, so that you can do things in, underneath the covers would create less geo buying calls, of course, underneath. But you don't, you don't have to worry about that. There's just properties you turn on if you need to, right? Now, this is a thing where you really are, you wouldn't do this in a visualization app for the most part, not, nothing I could think of. But say you had a, you're making a little game and you had a scene where you wanted to put some fog in the forest or, or, or whatever, say you're going through a scary conference and you want some fog in the room. Um, you, could, you can just in a couple lines of code, you can add fog to your scene graph. Right, so I just do this here, and I just you'll see it gets fog over my cube there. Right, it's about three lines of code. You can you can control the start and end distance of the fog to affect to control the effect of it a little bit. Envision you know moving in moving in a, a field where the fog is in the background versus it's coming closer forward. Another effect that you have is shadows, and this is something that can get expensive to do. Um, some of the bigger game um, frameworks even they, they do them, but they they can get expensive even there. So they what you have is what people would typically do when doing games is you you create a static shadow. Where it's just, you know, it's not, it's not really just, a, it's just, it's just texture that's being applied. You pre-calculated in your design tool or whatever. And then you would, you would not have the effect of, you know, somebody moving within the light, some geometry moves, you, the, the shadow wouldn't, wouldn't move. But if something, you know, some, in a lot of cases that can be done. So it's like a low tech way to approach things. And of course that's gonna perform real well. Dynamic shadows, they'll work quite well. You just gotta be, you gotta be careful with performance when using dynamic shadows. And they have a, you know, that's gonna get a true shadow effect because it's gonna calculate it all the time. You can envision how in a complex scene that could get expensive. Um, but I'm finding them working quite well. And, and a lot of the work I've done, and I'm gonna show you, is even on iPhone 5. So I purposely didn't bring my new iPhone 6 Plus Monster, which has incredible graphics performance. I just got my old iPhone 5 down here, and I'm gonna show you some things. That it's, it's pretty sporty even on there. And then this is project, projected shadow, which it's sort of in between. It gives a dynamic effect, but it doesn't project the true shadow. It just pro projects a, a, through a via a cylinder, really. 
right? So that can still create a kind of a, a fluid effect to the shadow, even though it like, doesn't look exact right, exactly right. In certain, game, certain classes of games, you can get away with that, okay? So now I've meant you know, all these great concepts, right? You've got, you've got this really easy to use scene graph API. You can, you can animate it with core animation. You have primitives. You can, you can change the look of the primitives quite easily, which is by declaring, a, setting a few properties, material properties, and control lighting. You can animate with core animation. You can use other things you know from you know, existing iOS frameworks and Mac frameworks like, like core image. Pretty great. And you can then even bring in effects that you would have in the past had to go through with shaders, like particle systems, which now become you know, quite trivial to, to bring in. If you want to, again, go through shaders, there's ways to extend in more advanced things that you can do. But they've also added a 3D physics system to this thing. So I mentioned earlier, when I had the slide up about the particle system, where I had the rain falling down, that the particle systems can be affected by physics. What do you think? Any node in the scene graph can be affected by physics. All you have to do, as the whole scene graph can basically, is set a property, right? A physics body property on the node. And the physics simulation happens implicitly. And what's the physics simulation do for you? It takes care of you know, animating, you know, falling based on gravity, or if I apply a force to something, it moves based on it. A collision that would happen, that sort of thing. Um, there's different types of physics bodies. You'd, set the, you'd, you'd get out of physics body by creating an instance of an SCN physics body that you set to the physics body of the node, and you create one of three types. There's a factory method on the thing to create it, a dynamic one, a kinematic one, or a static one. Difference being dynamic physics body is dynamic, the force is applied, it, mo it's, it moves and is animated, and, and supports collision within the 3D world, right, within the simulation. A kinematic body is, is kinematics. It, it can, they, they'll all work, they'll all support collision and respect collision within the 3D world. A kinematic body, you can move, you know, through the animations, things like that, but it wouldn't move based on the, the force being applied, right? Think if I had like a, something, some box spinning around with animation and things falling off of it. Right? The force wouldn't affect this movement. And then there's a static body, which is what I'd have here with these little boards. So I have this, this thing, I just, I, one of these games I just started cooking, a little simple thing, where I have the, these, the little transparent boards. I did it all with primitives. I have a plane representing an ice surface. I have a little puck of a cylinder, and I, I just kind of superimposed and made them transparent, a bunch of SCN box nodes there to represent the boards in my little, my little simple uh, hockey stadium, so to speak, here. And when I, I apply a force, to the puck in, in that direction, you see it, it flips the dynamic body, and then the, the cubes are a static body, so it can hit off the boards. What I'm gonna do is, I, I, I'm gonna finish this, we'll, this will be up online when I'm done with it. Um, right now I had it for the demonstration of physics. You ever played the table talk ho hockey games? So I'm gonna put the thing, you can slide the little players and flip them, and then those will be kinematic bodies. I will, I will rotate them, but physics isn't gonna move them, I'll rotate them, and they'll hit the puck and that's kind of thing. Really easy to do, and then you just constrain the motion. So there, there's the kind of, a, you know, and obviously you get, an, you get someone who actually has art skill, <laughs> right, and they can bring it and they can now make it look like a stadium or something like that. Um, but this is really easy, this kind of thing's really easy to do. And it just becomes, you know, if you wanted to make a casual game, something easy to do like that just becomes more of the same. So I have more levels, more features to it, but I'm doing the same kind of work over and over with it. Um, it's, it's quite straightforward and actually quite fun, right? So that's one kind of thing with physics. Now, you see the, see the rain falling, but see how it's like kind of going around a little bit? Um, what they've added also, in addition to having forces in this physics simulation, much like they just added in SpriteKit, the 2D game um, framework that they have, they have these 3D physics fields. So you can apply a physics field such as the one I have there, turbulence. And it's the same example, it's the particle system that I had shown earlier, just a few lines of code. Just apply a turbulence field, and suddenly now I get this kind of you know, th this visualization of turbulent flow. I mean, it's not gonna be turbulent flow like you were flowing through a jet engine and modeling it or anything like that, but it looks like th turbulent flow. So, it, and it's, it's quite nice. It gives you a nice, uh, a nice behavior and that nice effect. And there's other ones, there's, there's magnetic fields, they have electric field, they have a radial gravity. You can build 3D Angry Birds space kind of thing and make the Angry Birds kind of float around the thing. Um, and of course, linear gravity where the thing can just flow and so on. You can even, um, there's a way that you can um, inject in your own uh, physics field, to it, how, whatever you want to call a physics field, to do something like there's an, ex an example, where you can create a vortex, like a tornado, things like that. Very, that's actually quite easy to do. It's a few lines of code, and then I, I could have a tornado of the rain. And things such as that, but you get these ones out of the box, right? and noise just makes everything kind of go all over. And so that, yeah, the, 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 and the nodes would be affected, any other SCN nodes would be affected by that physics field, as are the, the particle systems in there. So you can create a, if I touched it, I started moving things around. I could, in, in introducing forces along with the physics field, I can create some pretty cool little effects, right? 
So you can see here now, you know, you have a, a pretty good little framework here, right? You can, you can do 3D graphics without having to really be a 3D graphics expert. If you are, you, you, it makes what you already know a lot easier and you can extend it and spend your time working on like the shaders, things like that. You can use the skills you already have, right? You can target the Mac with it. You can target iOS with it. So, you, you know, you're in the Apple world, of course, with this. You can do it all from C Sharp with our stuff. It works, we have a beautiful binding. Actually works, I'm not showing today, it works very well from F Sharp. And we've got some folks that love F Sharp in the company and they've got some neat examples. That whole kind of nature of the actions lends itself to something like a language like F Sharp quite well. Right? As does doing something like Sprite Kit, the 2D thing. So Sprite Kit, as I mentioned, and you saw where um, um, I said you can put a Sprite Kit, just like that movie I had done with CA Layer um, and Core Animation to play the movie of James and Aaron on my cube there. I could have done the same thing with Sprite Kit. It becomes a little easier actually to do something like that than going to Core Animation. But I can do everything I can do in Sprite Kit and put it onto the surface of some geometry onto, through the material. Right? But even more importantly, they have a nice integration with Sprite Kit such that you can overlay it. And this is where it'll come in really key, I think, right? That maybe you can make a nice effect and, and get some cute things by putting it onto the material. You know, for a lot, in a lot of cases, putting something like video or whatnot might be just a, a cool demo, but not as practical. Certainly, doing something like being able to overlay Sprite Kit nodes is what an SKN node, uh, SKN node is here. Is what I have here, you see in the screenshot, there's the little speed gauge in the lower right and that little camera. So those are, those are Sprite Kit nodes. And what they're doing is um, they actually get rendered in the same frame buffer. So it's real efficient. Right? So it's rendered right with the scene. And you can apply the, the point of it being applied to materials. That's how you would get, that's how I could do something like putting those things onto the surface, just like I did earlier with the image of the monkey in the video. And so with CA layer, you know, another way to do that kind of thing. Perhaps it would be a cool way to make another kind of effect as well. Um, so, you know, just like, you know, your creativity is sort of the limit. Very easy to program against. So this example here is an example Apple actually made called the, this toy car demo. We ported it to C Sharp, and we're happy to make that available to you. Um, it's actually a little less code in C Sharp, and we have a very nice binding for this. Um, so this is a great example, and I want to show it to you now. And I'll show it to you running from C Sharp here. Let me get out of this guy. And we can come up in here. So let me show you the thing running. I got this guy here. Looks come over. All right. So I got my iPhone 5, and you can, not a, it's getting a little warm because it's been sitting here running for a while, but um, I, I, uh, this thing will run great. It, you know, it's just because of the video. There's no audio thing playing there. That's just the tool I'm using to output. But you can see, if I touch it, I can move the car. So iPhone 5, right? And, and it's all in C sharp. So we're, we're getting the same perf that they get when you do it straight from the Objective-C example. Um, we got a little less code, but not, 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 not that's so compelling. And I can change the camera. Remember I said I can programmatically change camera by tapping on that sprite, the, SK, the, the sprite kit node, that's just what the camera is, and you can see the, the animated speed gauge. That's, that's sprite kit too, so it's overlaid. And I'll just, I'll just point out if I can get the car to drive. I get the accelerometer, then I move the car. The vehicles actually, I think they have a first class, uh, a class for vehicles called an SCN vehicle that's already wired up to put your, your wheels on because they figured that would be a common thing for casual games. I'm not a very good driver. Let's see if I can... It, maybe if I go to the other one, the other view. I want to get it over to where I can collide here. Yeah, so if I can go that way. Yeah, so I just get it over, I'll show you. So if uh, get it there. Oh, yes, get it over. Great, I guess collide it there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. That's why I'm. Not, my kids would be laughing at me. But um, you see the you see the the smoke in the background. That's a particle system. And the cubes are just primitives, which just the images put on. Um, you know, this is the art that came, I give Apple credit for, you know, we, we put their resources in it, which they were, they're kind enough to open source and make available. Ported all the code to C Sharp, works quite nicely. That's a particle system. There's actually a train in there. One thing I didn't talk about, um, they have these things called constraints. So imagine, um, um, I won't go into it too much, but things, things you, if, you, if, I, if I was trying to get it to collide into the train, and you see the train would move properly, with physics, so it, you know, one side would move. It's like if someone moved my elbow, the other side would move. There's constraints. There's another thing called inverse kinematics. It keeps the position of your arm if you're animating it, for example, um, proper. So there's some more advanced features too than anything I'm not going into right now. But yeah, this is this code is about uh, I think it's like 900 lines of code, some, something like that. I have it right here behind the screen. Get my monitor here for a sec. And you can see this guy. Here. Get that guy to go bigger. Pretty, 
let me make that a little bigger. I can dive through the code. If folks want to dive through the code, catch me afterwards. But for time's sake, it's going to be tough to go through all the code. But I just want to kind of give you the idea here. Is this is the class that I have. I have this, 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 this controller class, just the UI view controller I'm working with. And I create, I have a subclass of a scene we've got in there, right? That game view, that, that's just a, a, the, the view you work with is an SCN view. You add it to the view hierarchy like any other view in iOS. Right? And I've got a few hundred lines of code here to build up this scene. And what am I doing? I'm building up the scene from the primitives for the blocks. I'm just, I'm just doing like what I showed you with the, the simple thing, the primitive. I'm just doing a lot more of it. And some more properties to get the material so they can texture the images and so on. There's the particle system. There's a couple extra things for the constraints. And the physics is achieved through the, um, just by setting the property, like I said. The, um, the way I, I handle, the way I handle, again, I mentioned it, is the movement is through the UI accelerometer. It's just the, the classic code you've done with UI accelerometer in apps. It's the same exact kind of code. It's just I'm moving the vehicle. And I'm, I'm actually changing the force direction. There's an override. There's a whole loop of where it renders, and then it, and then it applies phys the physics simulation. And they give you hooks where you can override, and you can plug in your code, your own logic, before it does that. So for example, as I change single tap to double tap, that's how I go from, we go from forward to reverse. So that's we, we use it. We take advantage of being able to override the physics simulation that's going to simulate physics to change the direction of the force, okay? Really straightforward though, I mean, and pretty great. Um, so that's kind of what's going on. And you saw the, we saw earlier that I mentioned here, the, the, the sprite kit part, all I got going on there is this, this is other view, and now this is the, the actual view that I'm working with that I subclassed. So I subclassed SCN view, and that was just so that we could, we could put in the, you know, and we're, we're porting Apple's you know, example here, but it's so that I can put in the sprite kit nodes, the 2D overlay. And those are actually implemented in this third one over here, which is just the guy here. And that's just like the straight up sprite kit work where you can see we're just putting the, um, the speedometer and so on overlaid. And then they animate using sprite kit, right? So you're just doing some sprite kit work for the overlay. You're using scene crit with a, a subclass of SC and view to work with scene kit so that I could get the, the override so I could do the physics simulation. And a normal U, UI view controller to hold it all together. And I add the view to the, my view hierarchy just like I would do with any other kind of view. And you can even have multiple SC and views um, that are added. We've got some examples and folks doing interesting things with that. And um, it's pretty interesting. And you, know, you could have it in, in, in an app there. So, so I could have some UI kit stuff around and I could have the game underneath, but then it's not a game. Maybe I could do some visualization thing, you know, in, in, inspect some sort of data in an interesting way. So there's that example. We're happy to make that available today. That's pretty neat. And I want to show you then, come back here, a couple other examples we have. So Apple's, I, I encourage people, even though it's Objective-C, I encourage people to also check out the WWDC talks if you're interested in it. The last two years, the one from three years ago is a little bit obsolete now. Apple, they're, other than that they're great talks and they're done by the, the guys that actually made SyncKit. And they, they, the concepts here today, it's basically the same discussion I have here today. I actually touched on a few other things. They touch on a few more advanced things and, that I didn't and so on. But you, I encourage you to check those out. What they actually did is they made an app. Because remember, previously it was OS X, only, only this year did it come to iOS via iOS 8. They actually made an app that they did the presentation. The whole presentation was a SyncKit app. So the presentation is a sample, basically. And we ported both of them from the 2013 one and the 2014 one. And so it's nice because you have little blocks of sample. It doesn't pull together a full game or anything, like the, the toy car one, even though they had that. That's not part of the presentation, really, even though they, they showed it. But you can go through, and you can do it. You can, you, can, you can check those out, and you can then follow along with the examples in our C-sharp ports. So that's all. Those are both on Mac. Um, I'll, I'll, you'll note, I'll make a note that the newer, the newer um, support for scene kit it, it would only work with Yosemite, okay, so which isn't released yet, so that could be a barrier to you know, being able to use it for some folks. Of course, this is released on iOS 8. All right, and that, that's what we've got. So we've got some samples. We'll be doing some more samples. You look for some you know, more advanced talks on this. If this is interesting to you, you can come back, watch the video. I've got some, this business about shaders and some of the, be, be able to put particle systems on surfaces, work how you would actually delve into doing some neat things in the um, um, overriding the, the physics simulation, like I mentioned. The um, inverse kinematics, this other thing I just touched on briefly. I've, um, we're going to do some follow-on after the conference. I may put up a webinar or some stuff like that. So there'll be more content. And if folks are interested in talking about this more, I'll be around, probably heading over to the Darwin Lounge now and around the rest of the week. And we can, you can look, if you want to go in detail and sit down and look at this code, I'd be happy to do it with you. Okay? And thank you. And